Okay, so now it's time to look at what's on our economic horizon. I'd like to invite the economic panel and the moderator to the stage. Our moderator today is Nels Jensen of the San Diego Business Journal. Nels supervises all, supervises all the editorial coverage, and in addition, that's in addition to writing his own column. He joined the journal in 2014. Previous to that, he was the editor and VP of Press Enterprise, and he, serv uh, and he supervised the, the coverage of the Dallas Cowboy three Super Bowl victories with the Dallas Morning News. Nels will introduce our panel today. Please join me in welcoming Nels and the economic panel. Can I have Nels and the economic panel join us? There they come. Sorry about that. When you get a bunch of people who like to talk out talking, you know, sometimes you lose track of time. We have a great panel for you. We have three very distinguished um, local experts, experts on the economy, experts on the workforce, um, people who know our market inside and out. So we're going to get right to the, the first presentation. Uh, we'll hear from each of the three of them. We would like to have time for questions at the end. So if you have a good question, think how to, how to word it briefly. Um, and the one dynamic here too, Ray has to catch a flight. So at some point if, if Ray ditches out of here, it's nothing we did. Um, so we're gonna let Ray Major go first. He's the chief economist and the director of technical services for Sandag. He's a good friend of the Business Journal, was uh, the keynote at our economic uh, event in January. Um, so we'll turn the mic over now to Ray for his uh, economic briefing. Do we have a clicker or something that I can use to ma make the slides go back and forth? Is this? It's always good to start on the first slide and not the last slide when you're doing these presentations. So I think that um, I'll do that. Well, thank you very much. And um, I always enjoy speaking at this particular uh, summit. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the national economy and, and what's going on. Uh, this morning, I woke up to a report that consumer confidence has dipped just a little bit, which is something that I would expect, especially given the fact that we have um, you know, the, the hurricanes that have been hitting uh, both uh, uh, Texas and Florida. There's, there's a lot going on. Um, the stock market, though, is doing phenomenally well. Okay? It's up 20% in the last uh, year, year over year. Okay? I hope everyone's invested in the stock market, probably the best place to be right now. Um, mortgage interest rates remain low, and this is very good for uh, housing sales. Housing sales continue to uh, be very strong. Inflation is below the Fed's target rate of 2.2%, uh, so it's at 1.7%. And unemployment numbers nationally um, have slowed a little bit in August, but we still created 156,000 jobs. On the good news, though, in 2017, the median income in the nation started to increase, and it was up by 3.2%. We also have GDP around 2% growth. Okay, So the Trump administration had hoped to do a little bit better than 2%, but we're maintaining around 2%. And then we had both Harvey and Irma uh, hurricanes. The total cost of those could be somewhere between 150 and 200 billion dollars. And that could take a half a percent out of the growth in the economy in the third quarter. But taking a look at San Diego, because that's really what we're here to talk about. San Diego has an amazingly diverse economy. It's, it's really fun to talk about it. From a demographic perspective, we're a diverse region of 3.2 million people. We are the fifth largest county uh, in the nation. The people who live here in San Diego are younger, they're richer, and they're better educated than the nation as a whole. From an economic perspective, we have a $220 billion economy. If, if San Diego County was a state in and of itself, we would rank number 25. 
Okay? That's how big our economy is. I know people still look at us as a, as a small little sleepy Navy town sometimes, but, but we are really a powerhouse when it comes to the economy. Our economy is diverse. There's no more than 16% of any of our, our, our jobs that are in any one sector. And that helps us when it comes to things like recessions. We're a little bit recession resistant. And we're very forward looking. We have an economy that is positioned for the 21st century. Take a look at what's happening in innovation, for instance, with the military. Um, we have a tremendous amount of forward looking companies here in San Diego. And it's a great place really to be and do business. And when you look at the outlook, our population will continue to increase in the next 20 years. We'll probably add another uh, 600,000 people to the region. Okay, those people need to be housed and they need to have um, places not only to live but also to work. Uh, job growth continues to increase and we've had this uh, revitalization of housing in the urban core here in downtown San Diego, which is great because what we've created is a, is a work-live environment um, that really revitalized downtown. Uh, we could have gone either way 20 years ago, but things are looking really good. Um, when you look at employment, and this graph goes all the way out to the 2017, but um, this is the last recession, and you take a look at this is the total number of jobs. We peaked at 1.35 million jobs back in December of 2007. We went into the Great Recession in the trough, which means the bottom number of jobs was in, 2000, in uh, January of 2010. And you see that for the last seven years, we've had increase in job growth, continued increase in job growth. The problem with this, though, is that it's been mostly in low paying jobs. About 70% of the jobs that were created here in the region are low paying. And by low paying, I mean it, they're below the median income for the region. So what ends up happening is that if you create more low paying jobs, then the whole regional median income comes down, okay? Looking at it by sector, what, what's going on in the different sectors? If you look at um, back to the recession, uh, we're indexing this to 100, we have three big industries that really drive the San Diego economy. It's the military, tourism, and innovation. Those are the ones you'll read about all the time. Okay? And these three industries fared relatively well through the recession. And you can see the recession or the trough was in 2010. So you can see uh, tourism, uh, we lost some employment in tourism. And that kind of makes sense because it was a national recession and fewer people were coming here. But we recovered by 2012. When you look at the supporting sectors, and these are the sectors that, that support all other sectors, they're the healthcare, um, social assistance, education, and uh, government, you'll see that none of these sectors really lost any jobs, okay? But remember I showed you that graph with huge job loss, so where were the jobs really lost? The jobs were really lost in what we, we would call the core economy, in uh, retail and wholesale, in transportation, in finance, insurance and real estate, manufacturing and construction. Okay? And you fast forward through the recession, you come out eight years and you see that we still haven't recovered the jobs in most of those industries. So there's been a fundamental change in, in San Diego in terms of the type of jobs that are here. Um, the only one that has recovered is retail and wholesale, and you know with the shift towards Amazon and towards online buying, retail's having a really hard time even here in San Diego when it comes to brick and mortar. Uh, in terms of wages, looks like wages have increased since 2007, 23% increase for the top 25% wage earners, 16% increase on the bottom. But what happens when we correct for inflation? Okay, as an economist, I always have to correct for inflation. That's my job. Well, this is what hourly wages really look like. Okay, over the last 10 years, okay, hourly wages for the top 25% of wage earners has only grown 4.7%. Okay, so that's less than a half a percent per year in real dollar terms. And this is what makes you feel whether, like whether or not you're, you're being successful and you're getting ahead. When you take a look at the majority of the people, in real dollar terms, they're making less money now than they were making 10 years ago. Okay? This is one of the problems that we, we have nationally, but, but here specifically in the region too. Uh, good news is that the wages have started to increase in 2017 as unemployment has come down in the region. And what we're hoping for is a little bit of increase in wages in real dollar terms in the next year or two. Probably the biggest problem that San Diego is facing, and I would call this approaching a housing crisis, and that is a housing deficit. We're not building enough units in order to house the people who are here. This shows the number of building permits that have been issued going all the way back to 2000. We need about 13,000 units to uh, be built each year in order just to take care of that natural increase I talked about, the 30,000 people who are, who are either born or ready to, to, to go out and, and purchase a house. Um, over the last, since the recession, 
We haven't built enough houses to keep up with demand. In fact, we have about a 60,000 unit housing shortage here in San Diego. Okay? And that's part of what's driving the, the increase in prices. And for those people who are renting, you know how hard it is to find a vacant unit. And you see renting, rental prices also going up. Um, in terms of housing prices, they started to creep back up. And they're now as high as they were pretty much at the peak in real dollar terms um, when the market crashed back in 2008. The important thing here is that um, median housing prices by jurisdiction are also extremely high. Okay, so there's really nowhere that you can go to find affordable housing uh, in San Diego. What's affordable to us is not affordable from a national perspective. Median uh, price in San Diego is $593,000. That's, to me, just a mind-boggling, amazing number for the median price home. Um, in, in the United States, it's about $200,000 less than that. Okay? And what you can see, the, it's hard to see the green line over there, but even in the most affordable areas in San Diego, our median price home is higher than the nation. Okay? So the, the entire region, our entire region has very expensive housing. Okay? And so what does that do in terms of uh, housing affordability? And this is uh, my last slide here, Nels, just so you know. Um, this, this slide shows housing affordability uh, and you see during the, um, as, as we went into the housing peak last time, housing affordability falls, right? Because the prices start to go up and you see that only 9% of the people were able to purchase um, a, a home or afford a home back in um, 2008. The, hold on, um, does this have a, a laser pointer on it? No? Okay, um, as we went into the recession, what happened was housing affordability went up and you see that it went up as high as 46% during, uh, during the recession. And there were a lot of houses that were in foreclosure. Problem is that it wasn't average citizens who were able to afford those houses. Those were mostly purchased by developers or people who could purchase them cash and they would flip them. So that's when that whole flipping thing happened. But it wasn't that people were able to get into houses. As housing prices increased, what you ended up seeing is affordability start to fall. Okay? The median price home in San Diego is now $593,000. It would take a dual income of $84,300, okay, so two people putting down $120,000 in order to afford the median price home here in San Diego. If you um, <clears throat> looked at the dual income of the median income in San Diego, median income in San Diego is $55,300, you could afford a house of about $433,000, okay? And if you were a single person trying to purchase a home, making the median income here in San Diego, you could afford a home of about $232,000. So those are just the, the, the facts, and I just wanted to share those with you. Um, people might wonder why housing is more affordable now than it was at the bottom of the, uh, of the or the top of the last peak. And the only difference between the 9% affordability and the 26% affordability is mortgage interest rates. At 9%, the mortgage interest rates were about 6%, which is an average mortgage rate uh, if you look at it historically. The 26% is because we have such low mortgage interest rates right now. As you see interest rates creep up, what you're going to see is uh, affordability of housing coming down even further here in San Diego. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kelly Cunningham, or actually I'm going to hand it back to Nels. Thank, thank you, Ray. That, that's a really scary thought that we have a housing crisis and we have record low um, mortgage rates. We're going we're gonna to hit Ray up with a quick question here. You mentioned the job growth, 70% of our job growth and the recovery has been low paying jobs. Contrast that with now we have Amazon has put out this sort of um, national North American RFP for HQ2. Um, I understand you, you mentioned the EDC, which is leading our effort to put together a proposal. Can you brief us a little bit on what you know uh, in terms of the, you know, the current effort? So Amazon is looking at opening a second headquarters, right? They're looking at a lot of different uh, areas. Our area, from my perspective, could be very competitive, okay? Um, we have a talented labor pool. 
uh, to take these jobs. There's 50,000 potential jobs that will be built. That's tens of billions of dollars worth of construction also that would go along with that. This would be an amazingly good thing for the San Diego economy if we could bring uh, or, or, or win this particular bid. Um, in, in San Diego, we have a very capable workforce. Uh, part of it has to do with the university systems, but we have a lot of people here who are available also for um, uh, entry level and blue collar jobs. We have we have large workforces in the hotel and motel industry. Uh, we have a lot of people who are in the Navy and ex Navy people. There, there's a tremendous uh, workforce here. Our population, as I told you, was younger too. So they're looking for for new jobs. But this is the type of 21st century economy that I'm talking about. These are the type of jobs that we should be going after here in San Diego because this is going to be the future of of, of retail as as brick and mortar goes away. So one, one quick follow-up on that. When over, over the recent past, you've, we've heard about the need for anchor tenants, anchor tenants in downtown, especially anchor tenants in South County. Good jobs will follow when anchor tenants um, put down their stakes. Is South County part of those discussions within the EDC as a possible bid site? So there are a couple of possibilities that they're looking at. Uh, one is downtown San Diego, mostly in the East Village area. Also, uh, Mission Valley and also South County. And South County would be a very good place to put this because of the available workforce. Uh, the relative uh, cost of housing there is more affordable than it is in other places in San Diego. Um, good access to freeways, good access to the international border. So it would be, I think, a very competitive site to try to put something like this. Yeah. <laughs> hey, know your audience, right? All right, thank you, Ray. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to Kelly Cunningham, who's the senior economist for the National University System. And Kelly has been monitoring the, the San Diego economy for many, many years, um, has as much institutional knowledge and local expertise as anybody uh, experienced with the Chamber, with, with National and the Policy Institute. So, uh, Kelly, let's uh, hear some South County numbers. All right. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and, and uh, happy to follow Ray. Uh, we tried to coordinate our comments uh, as, as much as possible, but I think we'll, we'll probably over our, kind of go over a little bit of the same things. And, and, uh, but I'm, I'm also trying to focus more on, on uh, instead of the region, more on the, the South County area. So hopefully I'll be able to cover that with uh, the available information. So let me... The it's the big green button. The big green one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, the uh, this is the uh, the measure of our ec economy, the GDP, and, and showing the annual percent change and the the uh, adjusted for inflation. You can see we're the blue line, and and we've generally um, have exceeded the rest of the state and nation in our economic growth. In the recession, both us and California, we we went down more than the, the rest of the nation did, and, but then we came out of it. Uh, you can see us as the blue line, we've, uh, we, we were exceeding the, the rest of the nation, California, but in the last few years, we've seemed to have slowed down. Um, even California seems to be slowing. Now this data is through, for San Diego at least, it's through 2015, they'll release the, the 2016 in, in the data on, on, on GDP and, and uh, later this month actually, so um, I think in previous years that uh, we had that data, but or since we're holding this on the 15th, I didn't have it. But in any case, that's where it shows when we're estimating you know, to 2017, we're more than halfway through, that it looks like it's slowing. Now, California has been recently exceeding the rest of the nation. It took us a while, but, but California is mixed. Uh, it, it's uh, not uniform across the state. And, and so if San Diego, we're, we're lagging California, or actually what's happening is we're lagging Northern California and San Francisco where economic growth, and, and that includes, of course, uh, Silicon Valley has been taking off stronger, and, and Los Angeles, Orange County, and, and San Diego in the last couple of years is actually slowing down from that, and, and uh, so that's, uh, I think, something to continue to monitor. Now, when we get the new numbers, we'll see if uh, we're, in fact, at that, that position, but going forward, it looks like we are slowing down. Now, for San Diego, at least, and I think for coastal Southern California, part of this is doing with our expense of, of living here, and, and as, as Ray talked about, housing, and, and uh, it, it's a high-cost area, and we're seeing people are, are leaving uh, 
uh, we're, once again, they're, they're leaving because they can't afford to live here, and uh, that's, that seems to be happening. I, I think San Diego has also been a bit weak because military has been declining. The active duty military personnel, they've been winding down. Um, now, you know, under, and this is part of the art of being an economist, is, you know, what's going on in the political winds uh, um, with uh, our current president uh, who's talked about more money for the military, that, that would be good for San Diego, but if that's going to be happening, that's, that, that could happen in the near future, but for now, the military has definitely been downsizing and that's affecting San Diego. Um, here's uh, the employment comparison, and it's on an index, so you can kind of get an idea how, how that has been forming. You can see that both San Diego and California have grown after rebounded faster, greater than the rest of the nation. Uh, Actually, California started to catch up with San Diego. If you can kind of see, they're, they're, they had more ground to make up, and they've, uh, they've approached us. And now if you look at the latest data, which is 2017, it looks like it's slowing down just a bit. That curve is kind of tapering off a bit. And I've learned that you can't always, you've got to realize that this gets, these, these numbers are projections, estimates, and they'll be revised, so not to get too, too over-concerned when you see some of these trends. But, it gives an indication, I think, that the economy is softening a bit in, in this area as, as well as in California um, and, and as we look compared to the rest of the nation. So now I use um, an economic model that's called Implan. Uh, there's a word for that, what that means, but it, Implan is a, they, uh, it, it's a tool to, to measure economic impact and economic activity. What they do is they use uh, Bureau of Economic Analysis in income figures for both uh, personal income and, and businesses, and we're able to aggregate it by zip code. So I've used the 26 zip codes that make up the South County area, and that's where I come up with the, these figures for our GDP for the South County, that, those uh, 26 zip codes, which are you know south of downtown to the border and, and uh, a bit to the east, and, and that's uh, what makes up South County. So we can see it's about 9.6%, 10%, I guess, rounding of what the GDP is for the county. And as we go through the, um, you can see that, uh, and, and this is kind of the weird thing about zip codes, and I'm sure, talk to Ray and Sandeg, they'll tell you that you shouldn't use zip codes because zip codes are uh, measured, or it's, it's a way to deliver the mail and make change, and there's all kinds of issues with zip codes, but that's the, the data I have to base this on. Anyway, they show that our personal income for South County, now that's the, one of the nuances of it is they, they measure economic, uh, the personal income by the zip code in which the people live, where we live, but when you measure economic production, it's where you work, it, it, where the employer is, so that's a different zip code. And because South County is a, kind of a commuter, a lot of people live there, but then they commute out of the area to work. That's why you get sort of a different proportion where Personal income is higher, but uh, GDP is a little bit lower just because the location is outside of South County. I hope that <laughs> makes sense. And, and so you can look at the population is kind of similar. That's where you live in the households. Um, it's interesting that our, the households are a little bit smaller. That's because they're per household. You have more people. You have more people living in the household. So that's why the household number is actually a lower ratio than the population. And uh, and there's the other statistics. I guess I thought maybe this might help illustrate the point I'm making here that uh, this is the proportion of those figures to what the rest of the county of San Diego is doing. And you can see that, uh, again, the personal income is, and population is higher, but then the economic activity is lower because they're commuting out to other areas. So if you drive on the 805, I, uh, you know that this is, there's a lot of commuting out of the area. And that's probably typically true of, of suburban areas that uh, where people live, and then but they commute into you know inner cities or to into other areas to to work. So that's why those figures. But anyway, the point here that I'm trying to show is that it does. If South County is kept pretty proportional to the rest of the county of San Diego, but we do see a little bit of weakening. Even as I mentioned, that the economy is still growing, San Diego is still growing, but it, it seems to be slowing just a bit. And, and South County in proportion to that slowing is also slowing a little bit more than the rest of the county. So something to kind of keep up. Now again, this is unfortunately a couple of years lagging in, in data. We'll get new data in the next few months, but uh, that's uh, the current data. And um, one of the things that's uh, also I'd point out here as a, this is the growth since the bottom of the recession. 
you can see South County has been a little bit lagging, or has been lagging, I guess I should say, the rest of the county, and, and there's some reasons for that. Again, it's because the income is, uh, is part of that, but uh, employment, which is outside of, a lot of it is outside of the region too, so, or outside of South County, so a little bit slower growth. But one of the things I point out, you'll see that average wage has been slower, but it's interesting that if you look at household income, now that's the, you might, you'll have more than one income uh, wage earner in a household because the households in South County are larger, and you probably have more than just one income earner per household, and, and you'll have two or more, that uh, it, the average household income is actually higher in South County than it is for the county overall. So it's kind of the interesting dynamics of demographics. So here's the count. Uh, this is of employment, and this is the change from 2010 to 2015 after the recession. And uh, you'll see that uh, the, the fastest growing sector, of course, is, is health care, which is true for the region overall, that we're seeing very strong growth in health care in this region. Um, I think part of that is the aging bo baby boomers. As we get older, we're requiring more health care, health care needs. Um, but uh, so that's true for, uh, for the county overall and also for South County, uh, particularly uh, food services, business services have been adding jobs, retail, uh, construction, which we lost a lot of jobs, so there's a lot of room to make up in construction jobs. And again, these are jobs that are located in South County and uh, uh, transportation and warehousing. I'd also point out business services are, are a, a growing, or I did point that out, <laughs> business services are growing. What concerned me, and I, a couple years ago I, I spoke here and I, I noted that uh, South County had added a lot of professional technical degrees, but now it, it indicates that we're, they're losing, we're losing those degrees. These are uh, high wage technical jobs and I'm, Kind of curious about what's really going on with that. I, I've wondered if that had something to do with the military. This, this uh, military is another area that's losing jobs. Um, if, uh, but so that that's not the active duty personnel. But we have spay wars and, and some of the military civilians that are working for defense contractors. If that's been part of the uh, a factor there, um, you'll see manufacturing in there has actually been positive growth, and most of manufacturing in the South County is aerospace and shipbuilding, uh, uh, NASCO, of course, and uh, so, but uh, there's a lot of what, like I say, spay wars, and I'm not quite sure if, you know, it, again, it's the zip codes, and, and one of the things with government data is they have to keep it very um, private. They can't uh, reveal individual operations, so it's kind of hard to, to tell exactly what's happening with that loss of tech jobs that are in those particular zip codes. The zip codes include Coronado and, and uh, uh, that's part of the South County area. So something to, to be concerned about, uh, um, and we'll watch that as, as it develops. And I think that was it. Now, in closing, you know, we, we mentioned Amazon. Um, and, and Amazon, as they say, with 50,000 jobs. If, if they located in San Diego, that would be a huge boost to this region. Uh, to me, it, it, uh, you know, they're trying to say places I've heard every time there's some idea comes that they want to put it in Qualcomm Stadium, or what can we do with Qualcomm, and they want to put, I'm not so sure that that'd be the place to put, put uh, Amazon, uh, uh, especially since there's some kind of gas plume underneath the stadium, so I don't know if you want to locate your office there, but, um, but it, to me, the only, if, if they were to do it, the place that would only make sense in San Diego would be South County, um, but uh, I'm not so sure that, uh, that, that San Diego is on the list, because we're on the West Coast, and Seattle's already on the West Coast, you'd think they'd probably put it somewhere else. But if they did, anyway, we can, we can dream. Um, South County is the only place that makes sense. You could put it uh, on uh, where you have warehousing, uh, ability to, to locate it. And uh, also one of the points, I, our airport is in, in, inadequate for what they probably need, but you would be right close to Rodriguez uh, there across the border. That might, and that's probably an advantage being located next to Mexico. Um, but, uh, and uh, one of the other points about it, you know, when they, they locate, wherever they locate, the jobs that they would create are gonna be very technical jobs. And, and yes, we do have a, a technically skilled uh, population. That's, that's a, an advantage for it. But these jobs are not gonna be you know, typical warehouse jobs. They have machines. Uh, they probably wouldn't be hiring kind of the, the middle wage jobs. They'd, they'd be looking for tech workers. And uh, I'm not sure that we have enough tech workers. Uh, where do you put 50,000 people? But 
uh, that would be a, a boom. But I'm just kind of skeptical that San Diego would be a place for them to, to locate. So, but uh, anyway, we'd love to see it happen if it, if it were to happen. So, and with that, I think uh, our future, as always, is uncertain, but uh, um, we can always look for the best. I used to be the, the optimist at, when I worked at the Chamber of Commerce. I guess I've become a little more of a glass, glass half empty since then, but uh, we'll, we'll see as we go forward. Thank, thank you, Kelly. You're, you're also not the grouchy editor either, is talking about the skeptics. So, um, so we're going to turn to Mr. Sunshine over here at the end. Uh, Phil Blair is uh, co-principal at Manpower, uh, the San Diego franchise of Manpower, which is one of the biggest, largest, and most successful ones in the country. He's also an author, um, very active in a lot of civic uh, groups and, and boards and uh, here to tell us a little bit more about workforce and all those tech workers is Phil Blair. Thanks, Nelson. And yes, I am the optimist in the room. I think any business owner has to, has to live their life that way. Um, I thought I'd start out with sort of condensing the, the variety of jobs that, that Kelly was just talking about to see where the, the key issues are at South Bay. And, it, and it's inter really interesting that you forget how foods and brews, which um, is the huge um, food production people on the Otay Mesa, how important that is to, to South Bay with the 22% um, growth in jobs there. Tourism is big in South Bay at 20% and maritime at 13. Now the problem with maritime, and we'll get into that in another slide, is the ups and downs of a huge contract and then finishing that project. Aerospace is growing at 12%. Advanced manufacturing, which will separate that from just sort of production manufacturing, is growing at 11%. And then healthcare continues to grow in every economy. So those where the job growth has been in the last between 2011 and 2016, and the workforce partnership economists feel that it'll be about those same percents and ratios going forward in the next five years. So tourism. Big, big issue, and with the Gaylord and the whole development in the Bay Area is a, is a huge issue, and it's important we invest in the workforce to be ready for the tourism wave. The key skill in tourism is soft skills, essential skills, California skills, whatever you want to call them. It is so important that employees in this field, be it restaurants or bars or hotels or busboys, is able to communicate with the customer, shake hands, eye contact, dress appropriately, enunciate, be proud of themselves, be proud of where they work, and come across that way in the interview. If there are any educators in the room, that is the number one message that you can get across to your students, and they are responsible for that behavior, right? It's not learned in a book, it's how they carry themselves, and they will be very successful, and their skills are less important as their people skills, so keep that in mind. The other great thing about tourism is in our economy, the very wealthy people, the high-tech people are doing very well, and the struggling lower-end pay, we're sitting in San Diego right now, minimum wage is, is higher than the rest of the county, are the struggling people. Middle class has almost gone away. So you'll see at the Workforce Partnership, we're working to get those skills up to, to redevelop that middle class. But tourism is such a great entry-level career. I say, said earlier, you don't need core skills. You don't need to know how to run this machine. You don't need to know how to do this math or have 10 years experience in something. But you move up very fast. So let's put aside that it's an entry level dead end job. You can start as a dishwasher, busboy, become a waiter, become an assistant manager, become a bartender, manage a restaurant, and move up in demand as you become good. So it's a key industry to keep an eye on here in San Diego and not just push aside as low pay. Project Driven Contractors is a fancy name for the gig economy. 
I talked about the NASCOs and the BAEs. They get a huge contract. They hire a thousand welders. It's great for two years, and then they become between contracts, and they lay off a thousand welders all at once. And, and un unfortunately, <clears throat> the timing is not perfect. The BAE wins a contract when NASCO loses one. So. In our economy and in South Bay, because we saw the industries that are growing, are very part-time and gig-oriented. The article I wrote for the UT this week, in five to ten years, the forecast is that a company's permanent employees will only be about 50% of its workers. Now, I'm in the temporary health business, so I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> but, but keep in mind that there are careers as 1099 employees, as gig employees, as temporaries. And that's OK. But don't be surprised when you find that many of your coworkers are actually part-time workers or temporaries, or just-in-time workers is another way to, to analyze that. But obviously, we want to build in South Bay permanent, long-term, high-paid employees. But just know that is a very important trend that's happening in our economy. What can we do about it? Tech hires a new program at South Bay, and it's really, and you see at the bottom there, computer programming, network support, multimedia, you know, this whole coding thing. Free training and free internships. So if you're a young person in the room and you want to break into the technology business, keep this in mind. It's called Tech Hire, and I'll give you the, the, the um, website of, of, to go to the workforce and find out more about this. But these are this up and coming skills and the message in, in my books are we are responsible for our own career, right? Our boss doesn't care. Our wife and spouse care but don't have any say in it. The owner of the company doesn't care. We have to care about our careers, and we have to take control of them, and we have to get more education. We have to get more experience. We have to do internships, and we have to show the initiative there. So it's important for, to move up these escalators to the higher paying jobs, to the higher, to afford the houses, is the skill sets that we have. But back to tourism, you got to get into the game. And tourism is a great place, if you're a young person in the room, to get in the game and grow quickly. Another issue for that a lot of small businesses in the room may not know about is the H-free, operative word free, HR hotline and workshops that um, are provided by the San Diego Workforce partnership. You don't want to get into employment law trouble, guys. If you have a question, be sure and call the hotline. Um, and it's, it's in conjunction with the San Diego um, Employers Association, so it's a really good tool to have that a lot of people don't, don't know about. And schools. <clears throat> get involved in schools. Give talks on career days. Go to um, most schools have interviewing day where they want the juniors and seniors to practice interviewing. It's a key issue, but get involved in your school so that you can, businesses can tell students and administrators what's important to your business and what skills you need and what attitudes you need so that if schools and business don't talk to each other, then we're going to go down parallel paths that may not connect. And so be sure and get involved in your schools and career awareness. So if schools call you and ask you to come out and talk, they well, that's dorky and I don't have time. You'll have a lot of fun with it and you'll make a lot of difference to, to kids, which I think is really important. The other piece is opportunity use. And this is a big focus um, at the partnership and 11.6% of the youth in, in South Bay, and youth is the 16, 17-year-old to the 22 to 23-year-old, 11.6% are not in school and not working. Now that is a path to disaster because they're going to want money, and if they're not working, there's about two or three alternatives to get money, none of which are good. So you're going to hear a real focus from us about how to turn these people's lives around and get them motivated to get into, coming full circle, for example, those tourism jobs and tee them up for success when they interview with people like you. But reach out to them. They need a helping hand up 
and they can turn into very good employees. And we have subsidized internships, we have on-job training funds to be there to help make this happen. The idea is let's, let's pay it forward, get them into a job and keep them out of prison and keep them away from drugs and keep them away from trafficking. So it's an important issue that we want you to know about. Here is business at Workforce Org, really for businesses to go into this, see the services that are offered. Many are free, many are subsidized, but we want you to reach out to our workforce, some of which are struggling, um, to give them the opportunity and get some great employees in a very cost-effective way. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions um, now or later. All right, thank you, Phil. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I'm going to ask two questions, and then we're going to hit up the audience for questions. Uh, my first question is going to be to Kelly about closing the gap between uh, household income and employment um, in South County. There are more than a dozen projects, development projects of $20 million going on currently in downtown Chula Vista and Millennia uh, and across parts of South County. The pipeline, Phil mentioned Gaylord in the Bayfront, uh, Brownfield. Um, could Chula Vista, Kelly, could Chula Vista be the next Carlsbad? And um, do you see that gap closing between um, income in the South Bay versus the households commuting out of South County? Um, yeah, I, I think uh, you know, it could be. That's a good way to term it, the next uh, Carlsbad. But because uh, there, there's opportunity, room to grow. Um, it, it's a I think a desirable location where you're in a, a location near the, the, the bay, obviously, and, and uh, near the, the border as well. So um, it would take a, a tech company that, uh, that, that would move in and, and uh, take advantage of these, those, those opportunities. I mean, it's been there. Sure, and, and, but even, even without Amazon, you have office spec going up in uh, millennia, and you have more things in the pipeline, too. I mean, is this just sort of a, it takes time, but is there momentum for this happening now? I think I think so. Yes, because uh, you know one of the things that uh, Carlsbad's getting kind of kind of developed out. There isn't room for a, a major office. I don't I don't know. There's any s space there that uh, you could open a a, a large office building uh, and that's it's even available. It, it uh, but it's, it, I think Chula Vista and in, in the South County region uh, affords that. Um, you know, one of the things I read a, a, a saw study thing or so they they measured. You know, the, the, our smartphones, and I imagine every single person in here probably has a, a, a cell phone or a smartphone on them. Um, that smartphone is worth, uh, from when they first developed it, uh, you know, from the camera to the phone, the cell phone to uh, uh, the movie. Uh, you know, I mean, it's amazing. It's a computer. It's a small computer. That that's, that smartphone is worth nine hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars. If you when when the, this technology first became available. But anyway, what that means is that we're all working. I mean, we're, we're on call essentially 24 hours a day. Uh, not that we answer it, but uh, I always get people annoyed with me that I don't immediately respond to their phone call or their text message or their email. Um, we're, but, but the productivity that is afforded to each of us with this technology is, is just immense. Um, we're, we're much more productive. We can respond quickly. Um, that for good or bad, I bet that's that's the that's the reality of, of this world we live in. That we we can produce more as, as individuals and, and have a higher productivity value, um, and that's just something in our modern age that we uh, that that has come to us because of technology and, and those things are available. So yes, you could locate anywhere. That's right. We can we can uh, instant message from uh, anywhere in South County. So I'm going to ask for very short responses on the next question from Phil and from Ray. This will be the last panel question, Efron. Uh, does San Diego have the it factor to get Amazon HQ2 here? I mean, we can't get a stadium built. The convention center hasn't expanded. No, seriously, do, you know, visionary leadership. So uh, please, be, please be brief, but um, r Phil, you know, do we have the it factor? No. Well, that was brief. <laughs> well, I mean, let's be practical. Amazon wants 1,200 open acres. They want to start with 500,000 square feet of office space. Now, 
South County is the only place that has that. But how many, Eric, how many 1,200 acre spots do you have sitting there empty, ready for development? Not in 10 years. Um, the other it factor I'm concerned about, and, and somebody mentions, the West Coast, right? Their, their thinking is to get away from the West Coast, right? We have a large company customer here in San Diego who just opened a facility in Arizona because they don't want 100% of their company and production to be in one locale. Fire comes along, an earthquake comes along, a tsunami comes along, and they're out of business. This way they've got another location, and I think Amazon is thinking that way too, and that's, that's uh, a problem. But a lot of the boxes we do check. Right, okay. Educated workforce, for right. example. Ray, you want to add anything on that? Well, I tend to agree with Phil. It would be very difficult, although I think that there's always a chance, and I think that the we should rally around trying to make this happen because it would be an amazing thing for the region if something like this would happen. These type of opportunities don't come up very often, so we should do it. Okay, now we're going to, uh, we have time for just a couple of audience questions. Any brave volunteers? I trade cell phones for a question. This is a question for both the economists as well as for Phil Blair um, in terms of the value of the Im immigrant population as part of our workforce and as consu consumers, the value for, the, for you um, to answer. And then um, from the perspective of an economist, how we can grow our GDP and how uh, the immigrant population can play a role. I mean, I'll start with uh, and uh, the DACA participants are some of the most motivated, energized, educated, anxious to to succeed uh, workers and students that we have in our in our community and in our country. So I'm a huge fan of them staying and growing and, and developing their uh, career and families here in San Diego. So. I started my presentation by saying the San Diego region was 3.2 million people. Well, if you take a satellite image of the, the urban area, it's really an area that's over 6.4 million people, and half of them are south of the border and half of them are north of the border. And this, um, you know, we really need to look at, at the entire region as a whole. We just didn't have time to talk about it, but, but there's, it's incredibly important um, for us not only to uh, be concerned about the immigrant population, but also uh, what's happening just right across the border. We have 33 million trips um, annually that come across the border, and a lot of those are, are driven by their, their either shopping trips or people coming up here to work. And when you look at that, that's, there's a huge economic impact. Um, trade through the border has increased uh, year over year. It's up 15% um, uh, in 2015. The uh, the plants down there that, that, that do manufacturing and then send goods back up here are also vital for a lot of the companies that do business or are headquartered here in San Diego. So there's a lot of synergy here and it's something that we should continue to focus on. Uh, yeah, and I think you know, San Diego, with the way business is being done, you know, machines are gonna take over a lot of jobs. Uh, it's gonna, it is, it already has affected all of our jobs uh, that, you know, to different proportions so as, as smart um, machines get, become more prevalent, but where human capital is still so important is, is the creativity of, of thinking, uh, things that machines just can't do, and, and, uh, and of course you still need somebody that I guess that can turn the machine on and off and, and uh, fix it whenever it breaks down. So there, there are opportunities, and, uh, but our business is not so local as much as it was it used to be. I mean, with, Amazon's the big, big example. You know, they, you can buy stuff and it'll be at your door within 24 hours. It's uh, um, there's there are frightening things, aspects of that, but there are also very big opportunities. And, and uh, anyway, our, our markets now are expanded. It's not just local; it's international. Having an international population that can actually speak different languages and be able to, can, you know interact, communicate with different people is a big advantage. And I think San Diego is, is well blessed with that area, and particularly with, with Mexico and, and having our international relationships that we, we can nurture here. And okay. uh, th those are opportunities for one, us. One last question. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm Paul Borden with Home Fed Corporation. Um, 
we are a local real estate developer and uh, uh, number one, I'm sure I speak for everybody in the audience, it was really encouraging what we heard this morning uh, in terms of our recovery from the uh, recession. And yeah, please, question for the panel, please. Okay, my question is, my question is just a comment. Um, with regard to Amazon, the city of Chula Vista, between the city of Chula Vista, my company and a couple other companies, we have a thousand acres, contiguous acres, ready to go for development, which includes a 350 acre site that's owned by the city, uh, would be uh, a location for a university innovation district and north of our properties are areas for development of office space, et cetera. So, uh, Phil, I thought you did a great job, but, and you know, the likelihood of Amazon, big question mark with our, our, our city competing to the rest of the country, but we do have a place for that kind of development. Okay, thank you very much for the comment. It's a very good point. The fundamental RFP that Amazon put out is excellent for any expansion or any relocation. The education, we do need more education, uh, especially secondary ed education in South County. Um, so actually, it's a, it's a pretty good roadmap to follow for anybody. Can I just make a quick comment. Um, I think it's extremely important for San Diego to go after Amazon full force, 110%, right? But let's be pragmatic while we do that. But the, the process, we will learn an amazing exactly. amount about our community, about chunks of lands or contiguous or where there might be things we didn't know about. And so it's an excellent process. And I think we'll be very impressed about our Capability, so I don't want to be negative and not go for Amazon. Full speed ahead, but we'll learn a lot about our economy by doing it. Absolutely, I want to thank our panel: um, Ray Major, Kelly Cunningham, Phil Blair. All right, we'll turn it back over to Dookie. For your information, the PowerPoints that were presented, they will be on the South County EDC website. For those of you, there was a lot of information. If you wanted to be able to see it, it will be up in about a week. So I thought we had a great panel, provided a lot of great insight on what, what is going on. Uh, so to move forward with what we're, uh, South County EDC, we always try to be innovative and, and, and try something different. This year, we're going to bring up, we want to hear from the youth, because the youth is really our future, and, and we got some some students from High Tech High, they're going to come up, and I'd like for them to come up, and they're going to give us their thoughts. And I think it's important because, as I indicated, they are our future. High Tech. I remember when I was a kid I w in high school, I would never come up here. So I give these, these students a lot of credit for being able to, to come up here and, and give their thoughts. Thank you. Well, hi, my name is Pablo. Um, in the community of Chula Vista, I would like to appreciate everyone for being friendly and helpful. When I'm walking by my house or by the store, I get to see people smiling and saying hi. Um, most of you might be thinking, why would I say hi? But, some for, but for some people, saying hi to them means a lot. A person that will really appreciate you saying hi to them is the homeless people or having a small conversation with them. Since I'm a cyclist, I have been asked if I need help with anything when I'm just standing there waiting for someone. I want to appreciate the people that are very helpful. Another thing that I have with my, uh, another thing that I have seen with my own eyes is that when a homeless person falls or needs something, most people help them, but most ignore them and pretend they didn't see them. The point is that homeless people are also human beings just like each one of us. Since I want to be an architect when I grow up, I would love to design shelters for the homeless people. I would like to design shelters because homeless don't have a voice. Most of the days, they don't even eat. They depend from other people. One idea that I have is having the police go to the homeless people and tell them that they have a certain amount of time to get all of their stuff so the police would give them a ride to a shelter instead of arresting them. By moving the homeless to shelters, their convenience is that they would have somewhere to sleep and somewhere to eat. What I hope from the community leaders to help in this effort is for additional funding to increase the number of volunteers and to give out essential materials. 
With this idea that I have, kids, kids, teens, and families would have a more cleaner and safer community. Thank you. Hi, I'm Damaris Lopez. Chula Vista, my home, home to all. I love it, and I'm sure you all love it too. I love its beautifully diverse areas filled with different cultures and people, because without them, Chula Vista wouldn't be the home we love now. It's kind of ironic, isn't it, that the people who make up Chula Vista are the ones being treated as less. The vast majority of people in Chula Vista are people of color, many of which have migrated themselves or had a family member do so. Although many migrants have, fi have found the life they came in search for, Many more are stuck living on the streets or unable to make a comfortable living while searching for a stable co source of income. This is all because they didn't have the opportunity to finish their education or learn the language in the place they now call home. I've always said that as I grow older, I want to continue to speak up and start to take action on the things I believe in. But why wait? Why wait until we become, I, uh, sorry. They say the future is ours, but why wait until we become mayors, councilmen, professors, or any other form of leaders when these people exist now, and the people who are struggling now need their help? These families come from all over the world, whether it's Mexico or Haiti, you name it. They left every be everything behind, and it's our job to help them. So I have a proposition. Instead of pushing them away to overcrowded shelters and just keeping their names on records, why don't we help them get their education? The education they need to get a job, the education they need to pay their bills, to buy a home, to raise their family, and to live the life they came here for. Thank you. Good morning. It truly is a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to each and every one of you. I'm Brian Oka, and in my community of Chula Vista, I really admire the cleanliness of our community. From the beautifully made murals to the well-maintained parks, I'm glad to represent Chula Vista. While our field trip to Chula Vista City Hall, we met an individual named Armando, and he told our group his personal story on how he grew up cleaning the, communi the community. He held the weed abatement program, where their main objective was to prevent fire hazards created by vegetative growth. I want to give back to our community by becoming an individual eye opener for our next generation. Our next generation, children, teens, and adults. By having a conscious awareness and mindfulness on the current issues of global warming, pollution, and et cetera. World problems such as global warming and pollution can and will hurt our world. By destroying the atmospheres, the waters, and the plants around us. I want to become an inspirational public speaker that talks about the solutions that we can take action for those of all age. Currently, our community leaders are doing a satisfactory job in, educations, in educating the community served. As students of High Tech High Chula Vista, I'm hoping that we all continue to contribute and support the, our community programs, such as the Weed Abatement Program, in creating a safe and secured environment to live in, not just for us, but for the future generation as well. Thank you very much. As students of High Tech High Chula Vista, we have been taught to open our minds to the world outside our own. We have been labeled as young adults to show you that we have the mental capacity and physical capabilities to cater to the needs of those less fortunate. Our projects push us to move forward, think outside the box, and work amongst others to expand our horizons and learn about diverse cultures, starting with the city of Chula Vista. As we grow into adults, we need an environment that embraces cultural differences. We need a place that allows justice to play its role. We need a community that will build us up and allow us to fulfill our dreams. And it all starts with you, with us. Working side by side with elected officials would give us a better understanding and platform, which would bring us two steps closer to our final objective. We have a responsibility not only to our community, but to ourselves. This world will be left to us, our children, our grandchildren. And if there's anything we can do to ensure our safety and health, we need to do everything in our power to establish that. Over the past couple weeks, I have become aware of the upsetting occurrences in the world today. 
According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, one out of five teenagers experience a serious mental disorder at some point in their lifetime. The Union Tribune states that within the last year, the homeless population has increased by 27% in San Diego alone. The Associated Press reported the average tuition at four-year public universities has increased by 15% between 2008 and 2010. So what do we do? Whether it be having an accessible art center where students can come and relieve their stress, or organizing homeless shelters throughout San Diego County, we need to take steps forward towards a wholesome community. Because as Ronald Reagan stated, if not us, who? And if not now, when? Thank you. In the San Diego community, I look up to law enforcement as role models, helping people in the community and keeping us safe from terrorist attacks. Regardless of your feelings about the law enforcement, their desire to protect us from terrorism is unwavering. I have family members who are in the law enforcement, and on top of daily stressors of the job and responding to public perception, they still have to attempt to plan and react to terrorist attacks. Keep pe keeping people safe, especially during public events, is something law enforcement officers try to prepare for. But to tear attacks from parades and events on the street, K-rails and checkpoints can be helpful but add a tremendous cost to public events. Moving forward in the future, the best way to deter attacks in pedestrian areas would be with permanent environmental design, which could mean concrete planters, light bullards, and or light posts, which all in all would help in presenting, preventing the attack. It's called target hardening. Terrorists usually look for a soft, easy targets. With environmental design in the area where it's most active for, for events to make it more difficult to get to the people. In planning to keep San Diegans safe in America's finest city, not only do we need to reevaluate the funding we spend on public safety, we need to demand our city planners and city permit office to take a strong stance on integrating environmental design into all future building and remodeling of buildings. In order to speed up the process, the city would, could even give tax incentives to downtown building owners that retroactively add safe pedestrian walkways in front of their properties. Only by planning for the future can we attempt to ensure our streets and events are safe for everyone. Hello, good morning. Um, my name is Natalie and it's a pleasure to be here. I, as well as everyone else in the community, serve a purpose. We are ambitious people who pursue different goals and opportunities to improve our everyday lives. Although everyone seeks their own personal ideals, we are using those as steps to reach our main objective, which is making the community a better place. My role in contributing to achieving this goal is to provide my community with my enthusiasm, vivacity, open-mindedness, and perspective. Something that I am truly passionate about is helping poor people that have a mental illness or have gone through some type of trauma. This is something that I see constantly in our community and it saddens me to know that there are many women that have experienced rape or abuse and haven't received help. Something also that I find very heartbreaking is to know that there are many people that can't afford therapy. They need therapy such as cognitive therapy, behavioral therapy, et cetera, et cetera. We want to solve these problems, not propose unrealistic solution, solutions that are left unattended. So, instead of using our time to focus on all of the negative things in our community, let's transfer that energy and focus on all of the positive things and what's going well for those. An example of what I mean can be a case of malnutrition. There can be two shelters with the same amount of children in each home. In one of them, the children are well-nourished and energetic. In the other, the children are weak and sick. The question is, what is one of them doing to keep the kids healthy that the other one isn't doing? Instead of focusing on the sick house and how to fix it, let's focus on the house that's doing well and apply their strategies onto the sick house. I expect our community to always look for the bright spots and to be willing to try new problem solving methods. This way, we'll not only dream of solutions, but we'll take action and make them happen. Although our community isn't perfect, I still love the fact that we have such a diverse group of people and that we're all willing to strive for a happier and healthier community. Thank you.
hearing these students speak, uh, it, it touched my heart. We are blessed to have students like that to lead us in the future. I am honored to be up here with you students. Thank you very much. They're grabbing a photo. If I can have a representative from Sweetwater Authority come off to the side, please. Tony McKeon, we need you on the side as a sponsor of the awards. If you're an award winner or a sponsor, if you just help me out by getting off to the side, that'd be great. Each year, South County is proud to recognize those who make a difference by presenting them with awards. It's our, t it's our sponsors that make these awards possible. So if we can get all the sponsors over on the right-hand side, um, if we can get representatives from SDG&E, the Port of San Diego, U.S. Bank, Macmillan, City of Imperial Beach, and our title sponsor and award sponsor, Tony McEwen, to come forward. If SDG&E and Paola Avila from the San Diego Chamber, would you please join us on stage? Paola is Vice President of the San Diego Chamber of Commerce, where she leads international business affairs. She has worked relentlessly to highlight and advance binational commerce in the San Diego, Northern Baja region. Paola orchestrates the Mexico City and DC trips, taking the border issues directly to the decision makers. For her leadership on these issues, South County EDC and the award sponsor, SDG&E, are proud to present Paola with a Regional Leadership Award. Denise Garcia from the City of San Diego join me on stage. The other half of the binational dynamic duel is Denise Garcia. Denise is director of the International Affairs of the Office of Mayor Kevin Faulkner. In this role, she is responsible for the mayor's policies and priorities related to international affairs. The collaboration you see between San Diego and Tijuana is directly attributed to Denise. Whether it is fighting for border infrastructure or working on binational opportunities, Denise's behind the scenes making it happen. On behalf of the Port of San Diego and S South County EDC, we present the Binational Endeavor Award to Denise Garcia. Would a representative from U.S. Bank and Luisa Marcarthy with La Vista Memorial Park please join me on stage. U.S. Bank has sponsored the Outstanding Corporate Citizen Award, which is presented to Luisa Marcarthy from La Vista Memorial Park. Luisa values her community and uses the park's rich history to organize public events like the Dia de los Muertos, Celebration of Life Day. Luisa is a great individual who actively pursues civic and charitable causes. For a community focus, U.S. Bank and South County EDC recognizes Luisa McCarthy as outstanding corporate citizen. Representative from Imperial Beach and Bob Korber from BAE Systems join me on stage.
Under Bob's leadership, BAE Systems, the largest defense contractor in the world, recently opened an office in Chula Vista for 200 of its San Diego-based employees. Bob believed that he found the perfect location in the South County, but he was turned down multiple times by his corporate office, and he never gave up. And Bob's belief in Chula Vista paid off. After his 26th presentation, his request to acquire a site in Chula Vista was finally approved. The city of Imperial Beach and South County EDC present the Pioneer Award to Bob for his perseverance, leadership, vision, and belief in South County. And now, would a representative from McMillan Companies and Sweetwater Authority join me on stage? In 2000, in, excuse me, in June of 2017, Sweetwater Authority completed its new drought water, drought-proof water facility, supply facility, the Richard A. Reynolds Groundwater Destination Plant. This facility provides enough water for 18,000 families at a cost that's less than purchased water, and it uses less energy than imported water by using solar panels, all while reducing its carbon footprint. For its forward thinking and strategic planning in South County EDC and McMillan Companies, present Sweetwater Authority with Corky McMillan's Best, Best of South County Award. Uh, we have Mayor Faulkner here today, and I know he has a very tight timeline, so we're going to move up on the agenda a little bit. His vision for One San Diego is a unified city with an inclusive of city government that creates opportunities for San Diegans and deli delivers results for every neighborhood. He's here because he knows South, South County has opportunities and South County EDC can deliver results. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Mayor Faulkner. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, and good morning. It is uh, great to be here to say uh, a couple of words. And as uh, Ricky was just talking about, when our region is doing good, that's what's important to me. It's not about each individual cities. It's what, what are we doing together, which is one of the reasons that I was looking forward to be here so much. I, I particularly want to thank Cindy for all of the great work that she's doing for the organization. Cindy, thank you. All of the award winners who you just saw, I like the, uh, the dynamic duo of uh, Paula and Denise, a great job on, uh, on our border relations. Um, I love talking about the growth of our economy, and I love talking about it with people like you who are so passionate, who are out there telling our region's story day in and day out. And as I think of all of us know, particularly obviously with all of us here at the South County EDC, uh, one of the big reasons that we thrive is because we collaborate, because we work together, and because we realize that the strength of our relationship with Mexico, our neighbors, is a competitive advantage, and one that we work to promote, one that we work to grow. And every chance that I get to tell our story to business leaders, elected officials around the country, I explain how important that relationship is. I tell them about the collaborations that make us not a collection of different cities, on different sides of the border, but they make us a mega region, a mega region that is working, a mega region that is growing. Because I believe that there has really never been a more critical time for border cities to champion international trade between our two countries. Trade between Mexico and the US, I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here a little bit, but it's increased threefold, totaling $60 billion each year since NAFTA was adopted. San Diego exports have grown $5.5 billion under NAFTA. Our trade relationship with Mexico is vital to our economic future, vital to our entire mega region. 
and the South County is at the forefront on that. You are the leaders on that. And most of you probably own just one example. Our region right here is the largest region of medical device manufacturing in the world. And every time we get a chance to talk about that as a great example, as I said before, that's a competitive advantage for us. Companies like Thermo Fisher are choosing to operate with manufacturing teams on both sides of the border. Bridges, we're building bridges. Like the Cross Border Express, we are encouraging more travel and collaboration between our two countries. And now, of course, the South County is moving beyond just manufacturing into becoming a vital part of that innovation economy that is making us so special in the San Diego region. With an abundance of more Class A office space and land for research and development facilities. When we are talk about that and when we work on that as a region, as I said earlier, that's a strength. And that is something that we want to promote. I will say the issue of NAFTA is one of the most important things that we are facing as a region when it comes to our economic competitiveness. Um, that's why just last uh, couple of months ago, I convened local leaders from the US and Mexico at the border to say we're coming together as border mayors and our opportunity when we're going to be traveling just next week to Washington, DC, is to tell our story of success. Because if we're not telling our story, the national leaders, nobody's going to tell it for us. Um, many of you are going to be on that trip. I know Mayor uh, Dedina is going to be on that trip as well. Again, that's a story of success. That's a story of collaboration as we tell that to elected officials on the federal level that sometimes live thousands of miles away from our border. So they need to hear from us. They need to hear from me how important that strength is and why NAFTA is so incredibly important. Um, that's why we're going to be working together. And I also want to make sure before I leave that I really talk a, a, a debate that's coming up recently is to clear about the need to move forward on the federal level as DACA. As you know, I think everybody in this room knows that the young men and women who are here under DACA, they, this is the only country that they have ever known. Now, they are strength. They are innovators. They are serving in our military. They are our doctors, our physicians. That is such a strength of our country and a strength of our region. We should stand up for them, not just because DACA can Hurts, if they eliminated that, it's going to hurt people, but it's bad for our economy too. But most importantly, it's simply the right thing to do. And as we talk about that in the region, I think we have an opportunity again to tell that story. Last year when I stood up here, I said, we're sharing that success story. We're sharing our success story of what's happening in South County EDC and all of our EDCs working together. We have a good story to tell. Know that you have a mayor that understands how important that is. Know that you have a mayor that understands that when we work together as different cities to promote the region, we're doing the right thing for our families. We're doing the right things for our business. And probably most importantly, we're doing the right thing to create economic opportunity here in the San Diego region. So I'm not surprised to see a packed room as all of the great work continues to grow and continues to build. It is something we cannot take for granted if ever for one minute. Everybody here who's in business knows about competition. Our strength, in conclusion, is when we work together and when we celebrate what unites us, when we celebrate that relationship, particularly the South County with our relationship with Mexico. Count on me to help tell that story, ladies and gentlemen. Count on me to help grow that and count on me to help, help you when you're doing great things for our entire region. Congratulations. Thank you very much for letting me say a few words. Thank you, Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we ran a little bit over on some of our, our wards, and so we're going to go back to one more ward that we have. So go ahead. Yeah. With our title sponsor and the sponsor of the Golden Dedication Lifetime Achievement Award, Tony McCune and Eddie Burko join us on stage. Eddie is a champion for his community. He adopts over 500 families for Thanksgiving, annually for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And he also supports the youth in his community with his generous donations to the various ASBs, athletic clubs at the schools, and more. For his generosity and dedication to his community, our sponsor, Tony McCune, 
and the South County DC present the Marilyn Lastman Golden Dedication Lifetime Achievement Award to Eddie Bricko. Congratulations, Eddie. <laughs> Tony's absolutely correct. You're the one that makes it, but he's the one that sponsored it. So thank you, Tony. <laughs> With that being said, we're going to take a 15-minute break for a coffee break, bathroom break, and we'll be, we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs> 